Vamos a empezar con esta. We are going to be starting now on this second part. We're going to be having three speakers telling us about their experiences and, and their work. We start with Elizabeth Liebert. She's a member of the Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary, a women's religious congregation oriented on education. She is Emerita Professor of Spiritual Life at the San Francisco Theological Seminary. Graduate School of Theology at the University of Redlands, California. And what to say to you, she's someone who is committed to offering resources to future leaders of the church to help them understand and deepen their own spiritual grounding. She's also worked on gender, it has to be said, which is the object of the presentation she's going to be giving us today. She's going to be talking about the spiritual exercises and gender. Thank you very much. It is quite clear from Ignatius's autobiography and other records that the spiritual exercises came together in their earliest form in a context of spiritual conversations with women in Manresa, Alcala, and Barcelona. Only after Ignatius moved to Paris as a student do the women seem to disappear from his pastoral conversations as recorded in the autobiography. The women didn't really disappear, however. Ignatius constantly engaged in spiritual conversations in person and by letter with women of various classes and social locations. As women experienced the spiritual and apostolic charism of Ignatius, and other early Jesuit leaders, desire for closer affiliation with the Jesuits began to surface. Much of the appeal of the Jesuits for women focused on the opportunity to live a religious life in the world. Several women, including Isabel Roser, an early supporter of Ignatius, actually took vows after she appealed directly to Paul III for permission to do so. Relatively soon after Isabel arrived in Rome to work with Ignatius, however, the relationship between Ignatius and Isabel soured. And eventually, after reconciling with Ignatius, she returned to Spain. Ignatius sought and received from Pope Paul III permission to release Isabel and her two companions from their vows and then resolved to have no women in the young but rapidly growing society of Jesus. Ignatius formalized this decision in 1547 with a petition to Paul III to free the Jesuits for all time from the spiritual direction of women who wished to put themselves under vow to one of their number. What are we to make of these snippets of Ignatius's life? How might we move from then to now in how we understand gender and the spiritual exercises? What might a hermeneutics of gender reveal? Two contemporary American authors, Roger Haight, the Jesuit, and Aaron M. Klein take on the issue of appropriately adapting the spiritual exercises for unusual audiences. I am going to focus these remarks only on Klein's principles due to time, uh, but Haight's principles will be in the final paper. Though developed as part of her project for sharing the spiritual exercises with persons of non-Christian religion, her principles clearly attempt to preserve the unique heart of the spiritual exercises. I will address five of her principles, but, but focus them specifically on issues of gender and the exercises. That's the first part of my presentation. So the first of her, uh, her principles, seek to remove any stumbling block that prevents the retreatant from entering into the retreat. Given Ignatius's initial directives for making the exercises profitably, 
Ignatius clearly encourages the director to just this commitment. Ignatius provides a very broad set of exercises that he regularly offered women and men who were not, or at least not yet, ready to make the full exercises in either the enclosed or the non-enclosed forms. That's annotations 19 and 20, or 20 and 19. One example of a stumbling block for many women within the exercises is the masculine imagery for God. Listen to the words of this retreatant. As a woman who is a victim and survivor of incest at the hands of my father, I found it difficult to relate with God as father. The image of Father God made me more than uncomfortable. It made me angry. I felt Father God betrayed me. The thought of God as Father made me sad. I hurt too much to go there. I just stayed with Jesus. Then, through the guided retreat, I was introduced to Sophia, the God of wisdom, nurturing, compassion, compassionate, and unwavering in her love for me and all of creation. A block was removed. A door opened as vast as the eye could see and deep enough to reach the recesses of my heart. She with Jesus nurtured me, gave me courage to enter into the depth of my pain and gradually begin the healing process. The second of her principles, update the historical and culturally anachronistic aspects of the exercises. This task, particularly with respect to gendered communication and reception, is an ongoing challenge given each interpreter's own commitments and blindnesses with respect to gender. The delicate balancing act, however, comes both in the principle of selection, that is, is this point necessary in the dynamic of the exercises, and in the degree of adaptation, that is, does it make this point accessible in a way that the original text no longer does. An example, in it, adapting the exercises for Lutheran retreatants, Brandon Peck used as his criterion the foundational Lutheran commitment that scripture must ground all prayer and spiritual practice. Hence, he substitutes in place of the contemplation of Jesus' appearance to Mary, his mother, after the resurrection, Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. What is gained and what is lost if this substitution is made in general? Or for this retreatant? The line between appropriate adaptation and essential dynamics is frequently both highly subjective and subtle to discern. Third, adapt as lightly as possible for each individual, maintaining a mean between challenge and adaptation. It is not only possible, but often tempting to adapt away a particularly difficult point. Just because a retreatant does not have any devotion to Mary, for example, does that mean that the triple colloquy should be rewritten to omit the colloquy with Mary? Is it better to support the retreatant in an attempt to form a relationship with Mary through the exercises? You notice I am not answering the questions I am posing. Fourth, use discernment about what and how much is adapted. Every adaptation, no matter its size, should flow from discernment. 
does the proposed shift assist this person to meet and deepen her relationship with her creator and Lord, to deepen her discipleship, to desire spiritual freedom, to examine her deepest desires for how they might speak to her of God's desire for her. Fifth, add supplemental resources as helpful for bridging from the experience of the one making the exercises to the more foreign aspects of the exercises. This principle, as the others, is highly subjective. What additional reading or experiences might make entering into a given part of the exercises more possible or more productive for this woman. Finding these resources can be a mutual exploration. One more interpretive principle, intersectionality, which arose in the context of race, has immediate, direct, and often catastrophic ramifications in the situation of women. Intersectionality points to the interconnected and cumulative nature of social categorizations, such as race, class, and gender, as they overlap and influence one another and result in systems of discrimination and disadvantage. For example, in many cultures, simply being a woman is a distinct disadvantage in terms of voice, power, economic opportunity, educational access, and so on. Being a woman of color in a white dominated society greatly compounds the disadvantage and that compounding continues if that woman of color is a single mother working a low wage job without access to childcare, living in substandard housing in a dangerous neighborhood patrolled by gangs. Do you see how it accumulates geometrically? All these identity markers are both constructed and fluid. Indeed, gender itself is a constructed and fluid category only adequately assessed within the, in, the uh, insights of intersectionality. Taking intersectionality seriously then means that just as the experiences of men cannot serve as the norm for experiences of women, Neither can the experience of an individual director serve as the single lens on the experiences of women. Nor can the experiences of any single woman with the exercises serve as a basis for generalization to other women. Each person who comes to the exercises, either as the one making them or as the one directing them, is absolutely unique and the exercises will take root in each person uniquely. So with these interpretive principles in place, what can we now say about the spiritual exercises and gender? First, if we expand the horizon in which we view the exercises to include the experience of women in Ignatius's time, Oh, sorry. If we expand the horizon in which we view the exercises to include the experience of women, we can recognize the participation and influence of a company of women in Ignatius's time, imbued with an Ignatian vision, and lived out through the world of women, and also influencing the larger milieu. These women and countless women through the centuries that have offered and received the spiritual exercises challenge all of us to creatively adapt the spiritual exercises to include women's perspectives. Collecting these voices is both timely and urgent, 
and is the project that my colleague Anne-Marie and I are hoping to launch. Second, the history of the exercises reveals the world of women as a place of revelation, further enabling us to discover God in all things, even the daily minutiae of women's lives then and now. Take women's concrete lives seriously as a theater for God's action through the spiritual exercises. Third, since God's revelation can occur in the gendered experiences of women, inclusive discernment is essential in the inevitable struggle to make choices that lead to spiritual freedom. Such barriers as gender, race, and class create pockets of power and powerlessness, systems of domination and subordination, and situations of inclusion and exclusion that still plague us today. No longer can women's desires and actions be ignored in any movement toward the received interpretation of the exercises. Fourth, class is inevitably intertwined with power and power partially determines the, de the degree to which the fruits of the spiritual exercises can be actualized in the world. Definite class assumptions occur in the imagery of the exercises that assume, perhaps unconsciously, upper-class women and men. For example, early in the exercises, Ignatius notes, I ought not to seek wealth rather than poverty, honor rather than dishonor. Obviously, one cannot be indifferent to such things unless one has access to riches and honor in the first place. How can the current practice of the spiritual exercises accommodate and even welcome diversity in these areas? Fifth, right relationships are essential to mission. The tendency to limit women's potential by consciously or unconsciously accepting the cultural stereotypes of women is clearly visible in Ignatius's dealings with women. As the women in Ignatius's sphere of influence constantly grappled with the impact of his message in their lives, it caused conflict, challenge, ambiguity, struggle, liberation, desire for God, conversion, and suffering. Yet the historical data also provides examples of women helping Ignatius and Ignatius facilitating the gifts of women for the common mission. How do we foster this same liberation today? Sixth, the mutuality expressed in the presupposition certainly extends to gender. Companions, especially if they are male, need to convey implicitly and explicitly their willingness to learn from and at times be challenged by their female retreatants, and particularly the non-gender conforming among them. Now we move to some practical attitudes and actions. We can further now inquire about practical attitudes and behaviors for those who guide women in the exercises. These recommendations apply equally to men and women. First, know yourself. Know the things and persons that matter to you. Know your strengths and weaknesses. Ask for the grace to become aware of your blind spots. Own your own besetting sins. Be aware of how God works with you. Ask also for the grace to see yourself as a deeply loved sinner, the key grace of the first week. The more you know yourself and your own interior motions, 
the less likely you will be to project yourself onto the one you are accompanying. Second, act out of humility. Take each woman and each man, of course, as unique in God's eyes. Start with the assumption that you do not and cannot know what this woman senses, feels, thinks, and values, nor can you know how God and she interact, what God desires for her, her unique vocation, and so on. All these things are to be discovered in the dynamic of the relationship between each woman and her creator. Third, take the 15th annotation with absolute seriousness to allow the creator and Lord to deal directly with this woman. Do not lean or incline in any particular direction, but rather standing by like the pointer of a scale in equilibrium, allow the creator to deal immediately with the creature and the creature with its creator and Lord. Put more succinctly, stay out of the way. Fourth, adapt the spiritual exercises to the disposition of the person who desires to make them. That is, to her age, education, and ability. But be especially alert to your assumptions about the values attached to age, education, and ability, as well as to gender, mindful of the compounding forces revealed in intersectionality. The exercises that work for this woman become her spiritual exercises. And Ignatius offers a very pragmatic principle here. Give to those making the exercises as much as their circumstances will allow. Likewise, give them whatever will provide them with greater help and progress. Fifth, listen contemplatively, giving deep attention to the singular person you are engaged with, trying to see that person as God sees her. Use all that you are to try to make an empathic connection while at the same time bracketing all that you are so that it does not obscure the unique person in front of you. A delicate dance that takes constant monitoring and I might add some occasional supervision. Sixth, check what you think you hear and see if the speaker verifies, nuances, or contradicts your perceptions. Let her lead you into greater and clearer sense of who she is and how God is working uniquely with her. And finally, attribute the best intentions to your seeker as illumined in the presupposition. Ask what she means. Stay alongside of her, even in her critiques, her anger, her sadness. Try to save, that is to hold, to honor her commitments and her perspective as deeply as possible. Clearly these attitudes and commitments apply to any person who assists others through the exercises and any person making the exercises yet they are critical in the gendered hermeneutics of the exercises. This brief attempt at developing a hermeneutics of gender and the spiritual exercises reveals that gender is indeed a rich vein, yet with much still to be mined in order to feed our growing understanding of the spiritual exercises and their implications for us today. May we have the sensitivity to issues raised by intersectional perspectives on gender so that we too stay highly focused on how God is at work in each woman we companion in the exercises and how the spirit wishes to work through a wide variety of women interpreters and guides 
for the exercises. Thank you.